Bingo.
morning and good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. Let's stand and join together and sing He Lives. be seated. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. We are glad to see you in worship this morning and we welcome you to Grace Methodist Church. Methodist Church. If you are worshiping with us in person, we'd love for you to take a moment and complete the tear-off section of your bulletin so that we can know who you are. There is a way that you can let us know um, if you have prayer requests. Uh, we do or have questions about the church. We do read those, and so that's a great way to keep in contact with us. Meanwhile, if you're watching us online, we're also glad to have you. We'd like to say welcome to you, and we'd like to invite you to let us know that you're watching by leaving us a comment or maybe even sharing our service on your page this morning. While you are doing those things, I do want to remind you of a few announcements of things that are coming up in the life of our church. I will continue our Old Testament series on Samuel and David today and into next week. We'll do that through the end of August. And also we will continue singing your favorite hymns through the month of July. And I have a few that are left over that we didn't get to this week that we will use um, into August as well. So we'd love for you to join us each day, each Sunday for that and to bring someone with you as we sing many of the hymns that you wanted to, to sing and that one he lives is one of my favorites too so I'm glad to sing it even though I can't quite get to that high note but oh well that is life. Also want to remind you that the Christmas in July tree is up and it is finishing today so um, we might be able to hold it a few days if you still want to pick up an ornament and there are some that are left 
And um, so, and, and even so, you can continue to buy those items and take them to those local um, mission projects, those list, local mission partners, or maybe even bring them here, and we will get them there so that um, those are, many of those are ongoing needs for them, not only just during the summertime, but throughout the year. So, so we'd love for you to be a part of that and to make a difference in our local community. So that's some of the things that are happening in, the, in our local church. Are there others that we need to mention this morning? All right, then let us pray together. Oh Lord, we are so grateful for your presence with us. We are so grateful that this is the Lord's day, the day that we gather in your house to remember and celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of our son, your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the hope that he gives us in this world and in the world that is to come. And so, Lord, as we gather to worship, Lord, we pray that you would help us to set the worries and concerns of the week that was behind us away and lord to to put them away but and also the the worries of the week that is yet to come all of those things that are on our hearts and minds lord we pray that we would turn our eyes upon jesus to worship you in truth and in spirit this day lord we invite your holy spirit into this place to lead us and guide us and lord we pray that when we leave that we would be a little bit different than when we came lord most of all we are grateful for your son our savior jesus christ and it's all these things we pray in his name. Amen. Our responsive reading this morning comes from Psalm chapter 14. It is a Psalm of David according to the scripture. So it's appropriate that we'll be reading it this morning. Would you please stand as we um, responsively read this Psalm? I'll begin and then invite you to join with me. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none that does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on all people to see if there are any that are wise who seek after God. They have all gone astray. They are all alike perverse. There is none that does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge? The evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. There they shall be in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When the Lord restores their fortunes, Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. Amen. be seated except we'd like to invite the ushers to come forward and receive our offering and while they are coming let us pray together oh lord as we gather in your house we are grateful for the many blessings the blessing of family and friends the blessing of gathering in your house the blessing of health the blessing of your presence with us through the holy spirit lord as we count our blessings as the old hymn says lord we are truly overwhelmed with your goodness and how you have blessed us and how good you have been to us. And so now, Lord, as we give you back a portion of what you've given us, we ask your blessing on these gifts that we give, that they might be used so that others might know the good news of Jesus Christ. And it's all these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
please remain standing as we join together in singing hymn number 88, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. be seated and would the children come down for the children's sermon. How are y'all today? Um, there's going to be a picture come up on the screen. I'll see if you can guess who this is. Who is that? Do you recognize who that is? Does anybody recognize who that is? Somebody say, 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 say. What's his name? Simba. Simba. Simba's a little lion cub. Have you ever seen the movie Lion King before? He is in a movie called Lion King, and Simba was the little son of the big king lion Mufasa. And he knew when he grew up, he was going to be king of the lions, too. And he sang a song about, I just can't wait to be king. You can tell I love this movie. <laughs> My girls watched this one a lot growing up. So Simba thought it was going to be really super cool to be king of all the jungle, to be king of everything. And he just thought that would be the greatest thing. Everybody would bow down to him and do whatever he said, and he would have his way all the time. And that sounds like that'd be a pretty fun thing to do, huh? To have your way in everything all the time. Does she get her way all the time? No, just a little bit, just a little bit of the way sometimes. So you don't always get everything you want, but Simba thought that's what being a king meant. Well, in the Bible, David has been growing up, and David's going to become king one day. And he thought it was going to be pretty cool. And it is pretty cool to be king, I would think, but you don't always get to have all your own way. You've got to have a lot of responsibility when you're the king. 
and you got to grow up and you got to make decisions about wars and about people fighting and all these big important things and everything's depending on you to do it right. So David was probably excited to become king, but I bet he was kind of nervous about it too. But David knew one thing that I bet Simba doesn't have a clue about. He knew that God was with him. And when you have a big problem and a big th decision to make, you go, go to God and ask him. <laughs> I'm sorry, the face she is making over here is hilarious. <laughs> go to God with your problems, and he will help you make the right decision, whether you're going to be king or queen of anything or not. Always remember, God will be with you. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we thank you for loving us. But help us to always remember to come to you with our problems and the hard decisions we have in our life. God, we love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. You're going to hear a little bit more about Simba and the Lion King a little bit later in the worship service. As we come to a time of prayer in our service, I do want to remind you of the names that are on the back of your bulletin. We continue to pray for our nation and for our leaders and for our world. And so, um, so we continue to, to lift all of those things up and those are in your bulletin every week to remind us to, to pray for all of those things. Our mi local ministry partners, many of which will be receiving your Christmas and July gifts are listed there for you. I know that, that they appreciate your prayers as much as your gifts. And um, our missionaries are also listed there. Uh, I know that we heard from the Romeros um, not too long ago. In fact, I got a text um, from Patty this week that they, are, uh, that they have been able to meet their goal to purchase school supplies and will be leaving for Ghana. I believe that they're leaving in the next few weeks. So we want to pray for them for safe travels and for their work. Um, our next missionary will be Tim Datweiler, who will, is scheduled to be with us on September 1st. I know that is Labor Day weekend for many of us, but um, he will be here that Sunday. And so we'd love for you to join us and to bring someone with you as we hear from Tim about his work in Ecuador and as we pray for him and support him in his work. I do want to mention a couple of the folks that are listed under the member list. Amy Colvin is back in the hospital, so we want to continue to pray for her. Uh, Will Baker has an upcoming procedure. We want to continue to pray for Pammy, for Penny Gines. And um, I did speak with Dot Knapper this week, and she is improving, so we're grateful for that. Janelle Willis is also improving, and I know that several of you have been out to Alpine to see her, so she's grateful for that. Um, you'll also see Sammy Marimi on our list. Sammy is one of our international missionaries that we work with and spoke to us uh, last year. We received word a few weeks ago that he had a heart attack while he was in Africa and was in ICU. Last I heard is that he has been upgraded to a room and is doing better. So we want to, to pray for, for Sammy as well. So those are some of the folks that I, I know that are in need of our prayers this morning. Do you have others that we need to mention this morning? The family of Suzanne Copeland Carroll. Continue to keep my dad, Gary Teague, in your prayers. For Gary Teague. Okay. Others this morning. All right. Then let us join together in prayer. Oh Lord, it is good to be in your house this morning. Lord, in a week that has been so wet and dreary lord what we know is that you are the light of the world you are the light of our lives and so we look to you for help and hope and strength every day and lord we we pray that you would help us to seek you and follow you each and every day as we seek to become more and more like jesus lord as we continue to work through the story of dan of david and how you worked in his life and how you changed him lord we we are so humbled by the things that you did with this young shepherd boy that you worked in and through him all the way to where he became the king of Israel. 
But Lord, we, we know that that didn't happen overnight. And so, Lord, we, we pray that, 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 that you would give us patience when things don't always work as quickly as we want to or maybe exactly the same way. Lord, help us to trust you no matter what happens in our lives. Help us to look to you for hope and strength as David did. And so, Lord, as we hear from this man who was after your own heart, Lord, we pray that that would also reflect us, that we would seek you with our hearts and follow you with our lives so that others can see your Jesus in us so that others might come to know him. Lord, we are also are mindful for the needs that are all around us. We do continue to pray for the brokenness of our world, of our country, and for our leaders. And Lord, we, we ask that you would continue to work in and through, through them and through us. And Lord, when we are tempted to despair about the state of our, of our world, maybe our country, and maybe in so many different ways, Lord, we pray that you would continue to help us to trust and have faith. Lord, we do continue to pray for our ministry partners and mission partners both here and around the world. We pray that you would work in and through them. Lord, for so many that are recovering from a procedure, maybe uh, facing a procedure, maybe just under the weather, Lord, we continue to lift them up and pray for your healing touch to be with them. For others who have lost a loved one to death, we ask that your comfort and peace that passes understanding would be with them. And Lord, whatever we are facing, maybe it's something at work, maybe it's something with friends or family, Lord, we pray that into our situations that we would look to you for help and that you would work in and through us. And it's all these things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Amen. Thank you. We are fortunate to have so many folks that have shared with us so many of their musical abilities over the last several weeks. Choir will be resuming on Wednesday, August 7th. So if you would like to know more about that, talk to Gary, and I'm sure that he would be glad to tell, tell you more about choir. And, um, I, and soon thereafter, we will begin to hear from the choir as well. So we're looking forward to that. Well, over the last several weeks, we have been looking at the Old Testament books of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel and looking at the lives of Samuel and David. And today we come to the passage in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, where David finally realizes the promise of God to be the king over Israel. So I invite you to hear the word of the Lord this morning. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, You will shepherd my people Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. The Jebusites said to David, You will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought, David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. On that day, David had said, Anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say, the blind and lame will not enter the palace. David then took up resident in the, residence in the fortress and called it the city of David. He built up the area around it from the terraces inward. And he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, when we lived in South Louisiana... Jana and I went to see Lion King the Musical at the Mahalia Jackson Theater in New Orleans. Now, I don't know exactly how this happened, but for some reason, we ended up sitting on the second row of the theater for the show. We got a crick in the neck, but we also got an opportunity to see the musical up close and personal, that we could see the, the sweat on the performers' faces and we could see the movement of all of the apparatus and the things that they used in the show. So that part of it was great. Now you may recall that in the Lion King musical and in the Disney movie, both begin with the birth of Simba, the lion, club who, the lion cub who is heir to Pride Rock and the king of the beast. Now, much of the first part of the show and the movie is about young Simba's growing up and preparing to be the king one day. But Simba is impatient, and as we talked about with the boys and girls, he sings a song that is titled, I Just Can't Wait to Be King. Here's a part of how it goes. I'm going to be the main, M-A-N-E, event, like no king was before. I'm brushing up on looking down. I'm working on my roar. I'm going to be a mighty king, so enemies beware. Oh, I just can't wait to be king. No one saying do this. No one saying stop that. No one saying see here. Free to run around all day. Free to do it all my way. I just can't wait to be king. And while Simba couldn't wait to be king, it is obvious to those watching the show that he is nowhere near ready. 
In fact, it is Simba's own disobedience and a little help from a conniving uncle that leads to the death of his father and Simba's departure from Pride Rock, all because he could not wait to be king. But David was not that way. That when David is finally crowned king of all the tribes of Israel in today's reading, it has been decades since he was anointed as the new king by Samuel. After Saul and Jonathan's death, which we talked about last week, the tribe of Judah, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, crowns David as its king. But the other tribes decide to follow Ishbaal, Saul's only remaining son. And after Ishbaal was assassinated, and you can see that story in 2 Kings chapter 4, finally the whole of Israel, all of the tribes gather at Hebron to crown David as king. Now when David became king of the United Kingdom of Israel and Judah, he began a line of succession that lasted 400 years. And it was from David's line that the people looked forward to the coming Messiah. Few are more hallowed than David in the Hebrew tradition. And despite his human failings, which we will get to in a few weeks, he is still considered to be a great king, if not the greatest king in all of Israel's history. Now, Christians, we have high regard for David, too, as one of the main characters in the Old Testament and the author of many of the Psalms, including the one that we used as our responsive reading this morning. But we also look to the fulfillment of David, namely Jesus Christ, the son of David, the descendant of David who came to be the Lord and Savior. So whenever we think about David, we, I want you to think about Jesus because Jesus Christ and David are forever linked together. But even David, that great king, had his moral failures, had his human failures. But we look forward and the people of Israel looked forward to the day when the Messiah would come and would provide perfect leadership and kingship. So what might we learn from David's crowning as king in 2 Samuel? The first thing I want you to see is that J David was patient, that David waited on God. David was patient. Now, the, the first thing when I read this passage that strikes me is the patience of David. Now, I want to remind you that we met David several weeks ago, way back in 1 Samuel chapter 16, where he is anointed king as a boy. But that promise is not fully realized until here in 2 Samuel chapter 5. Now, 2 Samuel 5 verse 4 tells us that David was 30 years old when he began his reign. You might remember that when Samuel showed up at David's father's, uh, Jesse's place, that he was so young that he was out tending the sheep and they didn't even bother to call him. And then after he is anointed, he shows up to, show, to, to fight Goliath and he is so small that he cannot fit in Saul's armor. So it is likely that David is anointed by Samuel somewhere between ages 10 through 14. He defeats Goliath soon after, meaning that he could have waited as much as 20 years, two decades, for Samuel's promise and God's promise and Samuel's anointing to be fulfilled. I couldn't help but wonder how many times in those years David got tired of waiting. How many times he wanted to sing, I just can't wait to be king and by God I'm going to do it right now. Maybe it was one of those times when Saul was trying to hunt him down or maybe when Saul was throwing a a spear at him trying to kill him. Or maybe it was the time when he had to live in the land of the enemy 
because he was a fugitive from his own people. Despite all of these challenges, David continued to trust and to wait on God. That God did greater things for David than he could ever imagine. When we went on our trip to the ark in Kentucky last fall, we stopped at Abraham Lincoln's birthplace in Hodgenville, Kentucky. And when you pull up, there is this great big stone building. And yes, we walked up all of those stairs and to, to get into the building. And it's a very impressive building. But when you go inside, there is this small one-room log cabin, similar to the one in which Lincoln was born in 1809. A fellow named Jesse Rittner, this is what he writes about the monument and the two buildings. He said the two buildings reinforce the difference between the monument built in Lincoln's honor and his humble origins. The Grecian-inspired edifice was built between 1909 and 1911 atop the knoll where legend and some deeds with Thomas Lincoln's name lead us to believe that Abraham Lincoln was born. The now largely forgotten monument, and we were one of the few that was there when we visited, was once national news. Over 100,000 Americans donated money to build the publicly founded temple. The cornerstone was laid by none other than President Theodore Roosevelt, and two years later, it was dedicated by President William Howard Taft, himself a member of the Lincoln Farm Association, which led the fundraising effort. The intended lesson of the Lincoln Birthplace Memorial is clear. Those who begin in rags can rise to riches. Those who begin in rags can rise to riches. And this is only one of those stories that we could tell. But David is one of those stories. Think about that. The boy that no one even bothered to call becomes king of the entire country and not only king but one of the greatest kings so this one who once held the shepherd's staff is now holding the scepter as the king in later years the nation went to pieces and became occupied by a succession of conquerors and they dreamed of a day when another david might rise and make them a nation once again. So we wonder, well, why was David so successful? What made him different than everybody else? 2 Samuel 5 verse 10 says this, And David became greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. So David's success was not a result of David's personality and David's talent, but it was a result of God's blessing. This comment, which concludes today's reading, it tells us something about the way Israel thought about success. That God rewards piety. That position and the trappings of success are equated with blessing. Human proficiency reflects God's power. That's how the ancient people thought about the attainment of God. Now, we know that that is not always true, but we even see this in the New Testament, right? That Jesus and his disciples are walking along and they see a man born blind. And the question is, well, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus says, neither one. This happened so that the glory of God could be shown. We know that there are sometimes when bad things happen to good people. And there are some times when good things happen to people that are not so good. But what David tells us and teaches us that if we follow God, if we are obedient to God, if we allow God to work in our lives, we will be blessed. David was a good king because he was patient and he followed God. The next thing I want you to see is that David trusted in God. David trusted in God. So when David becomes king, he wants to conquer Jerusalem. And the Israelites 
lived nearby, but they had never conquered Jerusalem. A group of people called the Jebusites occupied the city. And you might remember that when the nation of Israel moves into the promised land, that they kick out several of the groups of people. You can read that story in the book of Joshua. They kicked out the Amalekites and the Canaanites and many other people groups in the area. But the Jebusites had managed to hold on to the city of Jerusalem. It was well fortified, located on a mountain, as, and as one who has visited Jerusalem, I can tell you that I don't think there is a flat spot in the entire place. It is built on a city, and you're constantly going up and down. But it, because it was built on a mountaintop, the residents had the high ground, giving them the advantage, not to mention the massive wall that was built around it. And so the Israelites had never taken it. But now David and his men capture it. And it is forever known as the city of David. Now setting up his capital in Jerusalem was a strategic, brilliant move for David. For one thing, you might remember that previously David had ruled and lived in Hebron, which was in the south and when he was king over Judah. But Ishbaal had ruled from Gibeah to the north. So by choosing Jerusalem as his capital, <coughs> it was a way of not favoring either of the previous Hebrew kingdoms. And it was kind of neutral ground because it was a city in which the Israelites had never lived until that point because they had not conquered it. So it was not really a part of either kingdom. So when David decided that he was going to conquer Jerusalem, he pulls his army up to the gates and the Jebusites jeer at him from their walls. They said no army could ever capture this fortress. And they said that it's so secure that even the blind and the lame will ward him off. But you might remember that David was used to impossible challenges. With, that when David faced the mighty giant Goliath with a sling and some rocks, Goliath said to him, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? David was used to being underestimated that he was the one left out in the field tending the sheep when the prophet came. But God had been with David when he defeated Goliath. God had been with David while he was fleeing from Saul. And David knew that God would be with him when he conquered Jerusalem. Verse 7 tells us that nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. By the way, archaeologists have found a shaft that goes from the Jehan Spring, which is the main water source of Jerusalem, into the main city. And while we don't know that if that is the particular shaft, it is suspected that David and his men snuck up that water shaft, opened the gates, and that's how the city was taken. And so I wonder, what strongholds do we face? What cities on top of a mountain with a thick wall do we face? What does the enemy say to us? Oh, I can put the blind and the lame here on this tower and you will never ever take this city. What insurmountable obstacles lay in our way to accomplishing the will and call of God on our life? Where have we seen God do great and mighty things in the past? Do we depend on God to do great and mighty things into the future? When we are in the center of God's will, he uses his power to help us overcome strongholds and obstacles. Now, I have to tell you, that doesn't mean that it will always be easy. That David still had to take on the Jebusites. He still had to conquer the city. That when he pulled up with his army, they didn't just throw away their swords and spears and say, Hey, David, come on in. They put up a fight, but
But David trusted God and he was able to do great things. So can we when we trust God. The last thing I want you to see is that David depended on God's power. David depended on God's power. All too often we equate power with political clout and military night, especially maybe in this election season where we have all of these voices that are calling for us to follow this person or to vote for this person. Peter Marshall writes a story about the keeper of the spring. And the story goes that there was a man living high in the Alps above a certain Austrian town. He had been hired by the town council to clear away the debris from the pools of water that fed from the mountain down into the village. The man did his work so well that the village prospered. Graceful swans floated in the spring in the village down below. The surrounding countryside was irrigated and things grew like crazy so everyone had plenty of food. Mills used the water for power. Restaurants flourished because of the clean water and for townspeople and for a growing number of tourists who came to visit the city. Well, years and years went by and one evening at the town council, someone questioned the sum of money being paid to the keeper of the spring. No one seemed to know who he was or even if he was still on the job high up in the mountains. And so before the evening was over, the council decided to save that money and dispense with the services of the keeper of the spring. Well, weeks went by and nothing seemed to change. But once autumn came, the trees began to shed their leaves. Branches broke off and fell into the pools high up into the mountains. Down below, the villagers began to notice that the water had become darker in color. A foul, older, a foul odor appeared. The swans flew away to another place. The tourists had left and some of the townspeople began to get sick from drinking the water. When the town council reassembled, they realized to their chagrin that they had made a costly mistake. And so they found the old keeper of the springs and they hired him back on the spot. Within a few weeks, the spring cleared up and life returned to this alpine village as they had known it before. You see, the story of the keeper of the spring, it comes closer to Jesus's and, and David's concept of authority. That, that You might remember that David was a shepherd before he was king. That David practiced on sheep before he led people. He knew how to lead sheep. He knew how to guide people. Jesus recast the image of kingship into the suffering servant where he gives up his very life for those he came to serve. To exercise real power in Jesus' kingdom, in David's kingdom, is to serve others. Such power is greater than political clout or military might. There is power even in weakness. So who is our king? Who do we serve? Our employer? Our political party, our favorite candidate? What if we were as passionate about Jesus and about what God has done in our life as we are about our favorite activity? Maybe our favorite football team or even our political candidate. Gail Ricuti was requested to give the commencement address to graduates at Princeton Seminary. And her speech that she gave was titled to live as a sojourner. Instead of, in, in addition to degrees, she bestowed on them backpacks. She was concerned that they might be carrying too much luggage with them as they left the seminary to serve Jesus. She said in contrast to suitcases, backpacks were light, more suitable for Christ sojourners. This is what she asked. Have you ever tried to hug someone with suitcases in your hands? 
with the heavy baggage of a densely packed suitcase, you might give those you are called to love bruises, or worse, lame them for life. But a backpack is lighter and leaves your hands free to serve and help others. It's good advice, not only for graduating theological students, but for all of us. We are called to travel lightly. We are called to remember that this world is not our home. We are on a journey of faith. None of us has arrived there yet. When we depart this world, we will take nothing with us. I have never done a funeral with a U-Haul. Instead, every funeral I have done has been with a hearse or maybe with an urn. We cannot live in the past, no matter how nostalgic that moment might be for us. We cannot wish for what used to be. Our present task is daily surrender, a constant recommitment of our lives to follow Jesus. You see, I, I can't imagine that David knew exactly where following God was going to lead him. But it led him to be king. It led him to have a great legacy and history. I can't help but wonder if maybe some of us who come to worship today are overburdened today. Maybe we feel like we're carrying those suitcases with us. Do those other commitments and concerns, as legitimate as they are, do they crowd out our commitment to Christ? Are our hands so full of other things that we don't have them free to serve and help others in the name of Jesus? Are we holding back something from our Lord that should be surrendered? Andrew Greeley is a Roman Catholic priest, sociologist, prolific writer, and best-selling novelist. And one day he returned to his former parish in suburban Chicago for a celebration. And at the close of his message, he told the story, the legend, about King Fergus of the kingdom of Kerry in the west of Ireland. He says that Fergus was a good and wise king, but eventually he grew old. Realizing he was soon to die, he summoned all his loved ones around to bid them farewell. He loved his people and he loved the green hills and the blue sky and the golden fields and silver lakes of his kingdom of Kerry. So before he commended his soul to God, he scooped up a clump of the thick, rich Kerry turf in his right hand. Well, soon the king arrived at the gates, the pearly gates facing St. Peter. Introducing himself, he asked to enter the city all the time, clutching the clump of carry turf in his hand. Peter punched the computer and learned that the king indeed had a good record, and he was ready to let the king in when he spied his clutched hand. When interrogated, the king reluctantly admitted that he had a wee bit of carry turf in his hand to remind him of home. Peter informed him that that was against the rules. No one enters the kingdom of heaven save with empty hands, said St. Peter. But King Fergus was insistent that he would not part with his clump of carry turf. Even when the Lord himself came out to explain the rules, the king would not budge. Each time he was told, no one enters the kingdom of heaven save with empty hands. After much time went by, finally Fergus decided that the rules were not going to be changed for him. He threw down his clump of carry turf and he approached Peter again. This time Peter punched in the code and the gates opened wide. And inside the king found the green hills and the blue and golden fields, and the silver lakes, and the whole kingdom of Kerry that he had left behind. Whatever we are holding back, whatever is holding us back, is so small and so insignificant in contrast to the grand gift of grace and love and mercy that the Lord wants to give us. 
And so let us surrender whatever we are clutching in our hands and accept what Christ the King has to offer us. We depend on God's power and not our own. By the way, if you wonder what happened to Simba, if you're not familiar with the story, after a long road and a lot of maturing, some of it the hard way, Simba returns to Pride Rock and he becomes a great king. Just like a fellow named David, who could wait to be king because he had patience, he trusted in God, and he depended on God's power. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we pray that you would forgive us when we want to crown ourselves king, when we want to do what we want to do. And Lord, we don't always want to follow you. Instead, Lord, we pray that you would give us patience for the things that we have to wait for. Lord, David waited decades for the promise to be fulfilled. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us patience as well. We know that you are still working. Lord, sometimes it seems like it takes an awful long time. Lord, help us to trust in you even when our world seems dark and broken. Lord, we know that you are the one who is still on the throne. So help us to continue to trust in you and to follow you. Help us to depend on your power, to know that you have the power to do great and mighty things in our lives, even to conquer whatever stronghold we face. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to learn from David's example and to follow you, to crown you the king of our lives. And it's all these things we ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. As we come to a time of response in our service, the altar is open if you would like to come and pray. I'll be glad to pray with you if you'd like for me to do so. I'd also be glad to talk with you about becoming a member of our church here at Grace as we seek to make a difference for Jesus in our community and around the world or to accept the grace and love of Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Our closing hymn is number 89, Love Lifted Me When Nothing Else Could Help. Love Lifted Me. Would you stand as we sing together?
has been good to see you in God's house this Sunday. Hopefully soon the rain will stop. Maybe the sunshine will return and our gills will dry up a little bit. But we are glad to see you in God's house. I do want to remind you of the, um, the Christmas in July tree as you leave. So if you have gifts, those are due today. And we appreciate your support and your prayers for all of our mission and ministry partners. And so let us close in prayer. Lord, we are so grateful that you are the king. Lord, forgive us when we want to be king, when we want what we want and we want it right now. Instead, Lord, we pray that you would give us patience, that you would help us to trust in you, that you would help us to depend upon your power and your strength. And so, Lord, as we go into a week, a week that is sure to be full of challenges, Lord, we pray that you would go with us and that we would look to you for help and hope and strength. And it's all these things we ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.